right. We're in Acts chapter 13. If you want to uh, turn there as we continue <laughs> our study in the book of Acts. And um, kind of have Father's Day message last week. So uh, kind of for sake of review, just to kind of catch up where we are with the Apostle Paul. Got a little uh, little slide for you. And, uh, of course, the title of the message, God has a plan. Uh, and uh, that's the way Paul is going to be presenting the gospel. And the first message that we get of his uh, recorded in Scripture. But uh, in the next slide, we've got, uh, uh, maybe this will help you, but uh, up there, number one, he's in uh, Antioch, which is present-day Syria. Uh, and remember, he and Barnabas uh, and John Mark uh, set sail. They arrive on the, uh, the island of uh, Cyprus at uh, Salamis uh, there. Uh, they preach the gospel uh, in a synagogue. Uh, we don't hear uh, not a lot written about the results of that. Uh, they travel 90 miles uh, across the island to Paphos, uh, and there encounter two individuals. One is a sorcerer, uh, wizard type guy by the name of Bar Jesus or Elimus. Uh, Paul ends up basically uh, blinding him uh, so that he can preach the gospel to uh, the Roman governor, Sergius Paulus, who uh, comes to faith in Christ. Uh, and we mentioned the fact that uh, uh, we know from, uh, from archaeology that uh, he was there uh, at that time. He was the governor. In fact, he came to faith in Christ. Uh, as well as the, uh, the rest of his family. Uh, they then leave, uh, verse 13, took us uh, there from Pathos over to, uh, to Perga. And uh, as they arrive there, the Cliffs of Doom, but I, what, what was it? It's not really the Cliffs of Doom from Princess Bride. Cliffs of Insanity. They arrived at the Cliffs of Insanity. Have you seen Princess Bride? That's where they filmed it, right there, Pamphylia. And, uh, uh, and of course, the John Mark at that point, uh, 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 departs. It goes back to uh, to Jerusalem. We talked uh, several reasons why uh, he had a very privileged uh, upbringing. His uh, parents were very wealthy, growing up in Jerusalem. Uh, the hardships of the missionary life he may not have uh, uh, seen that coming in terms of all that they would have to deal with. Uh, and of course, at this point, uh, Paul is apparently sick. Now he is sick either from malaria or uh, a problem with his vision and with his eyes. He mentions both of those uh, situations uh, in his uh, uh, writing to the letter of Galatia. Keep in mind, Galatia is the area. It's the uh, area of the place uh, that we're going to talk about today, as well as Iconium and Derby and so forth. There's uh, four churches that are planted in the Galatian area. When he's writing back to these churches in chapter 4, verse 13, he says, you know that because of physical infirmity, I preach the gospel to you at first. So the reason he goes there is because there's something physically wrong with him. Uh, and we do know in the, uh, that uh, records from the first century uh, is that uh, one area where they arrived at the Cliffs of Insanity, uh, malaria was, uh, was uh, very common. Uh, and the uh, first century cure for that was to, uh, was to get to higher elevation. So they immediately, apparently without preaching the gospel, uh, they uh, go 100 miles, they climb 3,600 feet uh, and uh, arrive uh, at their destination of the, the city that we're going to be looking at uh, this, uh, this morning. Uh, the other change there, without John Mark, uh, and we don't know if this played into it or not, but apparently uh, rather than have Uncle Barney uh, being the one that's uh, in charge here, it's always Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul, uh, and at this juncture, again, we saw last time as we ended in verse 13, uh, it now becomes, uh, now when Paul and his party set sail from Pathos. So, uh, two changes. It's no longer <laughs> Barnabas, who's kind of the lead name being used. Uh, for the very first time, we see uh, no longer uh, the, uh, Paul's Hebrew name, Saul, being used, but rather rather Paul is, uh, is being used. Again, his Roman, his Latin name, it's not, uh, it's not like he's never heard it before. Uh, you know, he grew up in, uh, in that culture and so forth before moving to Jerusalem at a very young age. So he's going into Gentile territory, and from this point on, he becomes known as the Apostle Paul. I kind of compared it uh, with my friend uh, David, who uh, married a local girl, moved to Waimanalo uh, in the homestead. Uh, and from the time they moved there, he was now known as Kavika <laughs> rather than, than David. It helped. And... Uh, uh, but so Paul now begins to go by uh, the, uh, the name that we are more familiar with. So uh, again, the travels, the leadership, uh, the sermon that we get to here, as I mentioned, is the, uh, the first one uh, that we have recorded in Scripture from Paul. Obviously, he's preached uh, you know, hundreds of times uh, up to this point. Uh, 
Uh, we mentioned, remember, that from the juncture or from the time of his conversion on the Damascus Road to the time that he shows up again uh, there in, uh, in Antioch, Syria, with Barnabas, it's about a 10-year span. So uh, Paul's been very active in the ministry at this point, uh, even before this uh, missionary journey. Uh, the text, in, in terms of Paul's sermon, can be broken up uh, very easily in three sections, all beginning uh, with a similar phrase. Verse 15, men and brethren. Verse 26, men and brethren. Verse 38, let it be known to you, brethren. At each of those junctures, he, in a sense, changes subjects. Now, the whole thing is to present the gospel in the synagogue to two groups of people. Obviously, to the Jews that were there, that were raised in Judaism, uh, into what we would refer to later as Gentiles at the gate, or he will refer to them as the God-fearers. Men like Cornelius that we've already met uh, early on uh, in the book of Acts. These are Gentiles uh, who are, have come to faith in the God of Judaism, uh, rejecting the pantheon of gods of the uh, Greek mythology and so forth, uh, and, uh, and they come to faith, but they haven't fully entered in into the actual ceremonies of becoming Jewish themselves. So they're there. Uh, they're generous with their giving, we find out. Uh, they are God-fearing, uh, and they are there to uh, study the scriptures and hear the word of God. Uh, they become uh, a group of people, men and women, who are uh, very open to the gospel of, uh, of Jesus Christ. Uh, it's to both of these groups of people Paul is preaching to. Well, let's look at... Um, our first uh, uh, section here, the people of his plan, is what we're calling it, uh, the emphasis of, on the nation of Israel, verse 14 to 25. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Shabbat, or the Sabbath day, and sat down. And after reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them, saying, Men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Then people, uh, Paul stood up, motioning with his hands, uh, and said, uh, men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he brought them out of it. Now for a time of about 40 years, he put up with their ways in the wilderness. Uh, and when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land to them by allotment. After that, he gave them judges for about 450 years until Samuel the prophet. And afterwards, they asked for a king, so God gave them Saul, son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up for them David as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. For this man's seed, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a Savior, Jesus. After John had preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and as John was finishing his course, he said, Who do you think I am? I am not he, but behold, there comes one after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to loose. Again, Paul's got a method uh, for, his, uh, for his ministry and for these mission trips that is very, very consistent uh, it's very smart. It's very strategic. He'd basically try to go to major Roman cities, uh, and he would begin at the synagogue where he could reason with the scriptures to the people there, again, to the Jews that are there, but also to these God-fearing Gentiles that are there. Uh, and then out of them, those that got saved uh, basically plant a church uh, in that city and then uh, continue to, uh, to move on. Uh, it was an open door for the Apostle Paul to do this, well, because he was Saul of Tarsus. Uh, he could go into a synagogue, as we see here, and then be invited to speak. Uh, was it like open mic Friday? No, that wasn't it at all. Not everybody could do this. It's just that uh, uh, Paul was somebody within, within Judaism. And uh, there's more than uh, one writer, again, like our good friend Dr. Hawking, uh, that says the Apostle Paul was well known in the first century. Uh, he had studied at the feet of Gamaliel, even to this day, uh, one of the great rabbis of, uh, of Judaism. Uh, he had, uh, uh, we at least uh, tried to make a case for, uh, was possibly a, a member of the Sanhedrin, uh, so he was well known. So when the Apostle Paul, or Saul of Tarsus, shows up in your synagogue, uh, you, you give him the floor. And uh, hey, do you have a word for us? Anything to, uh, uh, anything to say? And that's what's going on here. And that pattern is followed 
uh, throughout Paul's uh, missionary journeys. So having said that, now he begins his, uh, his sermon. And he's going to uh, try, of course, uh, to, as in, a, as in an appealing way, as he possibly can, present the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, to this group of people. Uh, first, we see that he shows God's plan as seen in history. Uh, and we certainly say that uh, history is uh, his story. Uh, and from the Christian perspective, we see history as optimistic. Uh, we're not cynics about history. We see that God has a plan. Uh, God is orchestrating uh, uh, his plan, uh, and we know it will culminate uh, with the return of Jesus Christ to planet Earth to establish his, uh, his kingdom. Uh, things may look dark, things may look evil, but we've read the end of the book, and we know that what happens, and we're optimistic. We're not cynical about it. And Paul then begins uh, with the history of Israel. And if you have uh, ever an opportunity to share with a, a Jewish person, uh, this is a good place to start, this idea of uh, God has chosen them, the people of Israel. And uh, that's not a bad thing to say. Wow, that must be awesome to be Jewish and know that God chose your people of all the peoples of the earth. Jewish person will give you a couple minutes right there, just, just based on that, uh, that one statement. If you, have, if you happen to be able to say it, like I can say, oh, and uh, I've been to Israel a couple of times. It was a great experience. Now I got two more minutes. I got at least four minutes to try to get the, get the gospel in. Uh, and that's what Paul's doing here in verse 16. Men of Israel and you who fear God, there's our two categories of people. Uh, he's presenting the gospel to, and he first he presents God's sovereignty uh, as the chosen uh, Jewish people. Verse 17, the God of Israel chose our father. That's a word that sometimes is translated uh, elect uh, in, in, uh, in the Greek and the voice that's used. It means God has done this in and of himself. Uh, the Jewish people didn't do anything to get God to choose them. God simply decided and determined beforehand to choose them. Uh, and so Paul begins there. We see the same thing with Stephen before the Sanhedrin. Uh, Peter will use the same strategy. Uh, and of course, uh, again, this is another one of those uh, Jewish people love their history. So if you're uh, going to make an appeal to them, and you know some of the history and can point out God's sovereignty uh, over them and so forth, uh, it's a good thing uh, to do. Secondly, he mentions God's patience with the Jewish people. Uh, I don't know if you noted that in verse 18. Uh, Paul's pretty gracious here when he says, now for about a time of 40 years, he put up with their ways in the wilderness. Didn't want to go into great detail about their many rebellions. God having to deal with their rebellions. God having to deal with their lack of faith of not entering into the promised land uh, and taking the word of the, the ten spies with no faith versus the, uh, the word of Joshua and Caleb and entering in. That whole generation having to die in the wilderness, he just kind of uh, schmoozes right over it and says, you know, uh, there's, a little, there's a couple of disappointments there. Let's just keep moving on. And, uh, uh, and Paul's uh, very smart about this, as, as we should be in sharing our faith as, uh, as well. Uh, we'll see him do it with a group of Gentiles when we get to Acts 17. Uh, and he's on the, uh, uh, the Aragapius uh, there at Mars Hill, uh, dealing with the Greek philosophers of his day. He doesn't start out by saying, I notice you worship a bunch of idols. Uh, you guys are idiots for doing that. No, he doesn't say that. He says, I've noticed there's many idols. You guys are very religious people. And I've noticed there's an idol over here to the unknown God. And I wanted to be able to tell you about that unknown, unknown God. He takes right from where they're at and their culture. As we get to it, there are some very interesting words that he uses in that address that will directly appeal and kind of click with their ears. Like, this guy knows what he's talking about here. Uh, and again, we need to be able to do those same, same kinds of things uh, in sharing our faith as well. Uh, secondly, uh, he mentions... God's grace, and he really uh, uh, not just uh, breezes over the wilderness wandering, but he omits part of the history. Notice that he's only trying to get to David so he could get to the descendant of David so he can link Judaism with Christianity, so he can link uh, David and the promises and the sovereignty of God over the Jewish people uh, with uh, Christianity and Jesus uh, himself. He doesn't go into, oh yeah, and then there was that... Uh, uh, the rebellion of the people of Israel got so bad that God had to judge them and burn the city to the ground and take everybody. Now, he, see, he doesn't even go there. He has a point he's going to in terms of reciting this history, uh, and, uh, and he does it in a very, uh, a very gracious way. Uh, but he gets to verse 21, and afterwards they asked for a king. So God gave them Saul, son of Kish, uh, 
Uh, and that's a turning point. Paul, Paul bridges this gap uh, in time by saying, and he promised, and he promised. Yes, Saul came. They asked for a king. By the way, that wasn't a good thing, if you remember the story. And asking for a king, the people were saying, we want to be like the other nations. That's what they actually said. The Philistines, their arch enemy, uh, had a king, which meant they had a standing army. That was really the issue. It's interesting. Uh, Israel today pretty much defends themselves primarily with reservists. Uh, when you turn 18, if you're a guy, you go in the military for three years. If you're a gal, you go in for two years, and you remain in the reserves, I think, until you're about 45 years old. Uh, when uh, they are attacked, they need all hands on deck to be able to uh, uh, defend themselves, uh, which is another issue, of course, but why they need defensible borders, because they don't really have a standing army. Uh, they have a, literally a citizen army, and it typically takes about 48 hours or so uh, to get everybody in place. Uh, and so they can't afford to shrink their country back any more than uh, they have right now. Uh, but that was the issue in calling out for a, a king. They wanted a standing army. They wanted to be like the other uh, nations around them. Uh, and of course, uh, in the end, God needed to move, remove Saul from that, that kingdom and replace him with David. Uh, and again, here, Paul quoting the scriptures, a man after God's own heart who would do all of his will. Of course, uh, Saul would, uh, would never do that. Uh, there's certainly a, a direct application for us because uh, we ourselves can find ourselves in a wilderness wandering also. You know, we can read through that story and think, you know, what is up with these knuckleheads? You know, God's, de you know, delivered them out of Egypt. You know, they crossed the Red Sea. I mean, these outrageous miracles. You know, we're like, if I saw an outrageous miracle like that, man, I would never doubt again. Oh, really? You know, <laughs> how about your new birth and being born again? You know, it's uh, God does miracles around us all the time, and yet we still struggle in the same way. Uh, places he wants us to go, things he wants us to do, a promised land for us uh, in terms of a plan for our lives and so forth. And we're so reluctant uh, at times, and we can find ourselves in the, of course, I'm talking about other people, not us right here. The, uh, those Christians that grumble and complain over circumstances uh, uh, around them, even as the people did here. Uh, the... Uh, uh, again, you know, our, our problem is, uh, is uh, uh, not the parts of the Bible that we uh, don't understand. It's the parts that we do understand. You know, it's, uh, uh, it's pretty obvious and easy to relate to these stories that are in here about uh, God's people, Israel. And we experience the same things. Uh, we have, as a nation, certainly didn't want to be uh, uh, always controlled by godly and righteous men. And we, have, as a nation, has cried out for a king. Uh, we want to be like the other nations around us, and, uh, and we're suffering the consequences as a result of it today. Uh, crying out for a king might involve a, a career or a job, uh, who you'll marry, how you might raise your kids, how you might manage your finances. I want to be like the other nations. I want to be like those uh, out there in the world. I think it's a better way. Thank you, God, for my salvation. Uh, thank you for leading and guiding me up to this point, but I got it. <laughs> I got it. Sometimes we, we call that being King Me. You know, either, either Jesus is on the throne or we are. It's, uh, you know, but he'll let us. You know, he'll stand aside and he'll let us. Uh, and he did it with the people. They got what they wanted. Uh, they got uh, Saul. But then, again, God's plan continued. Even though they were not following, not always uh, accepting of his plans for them, his plan was going to move forward. Uh, and it was through the person of David. So God's plan included a promise, and, uh, and Saul is, or Paul is quick to uh, mention that here. Every pious Jew knew that the Messiah would come from David's family. Uh, it was promised back in 2 Samuel 7, 12, as God says to David, When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up uh, your seed after you who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. It was always a concern with Israel that they had that Davidic son on the throne. Because as long as they had someone in the lineage of David, may not be looking too good under these kings right now, but as long as that king is there, there's a hope that maybe his son will be the one. The Messiah will come. It's got to come. God promised it. It's got to happen. And of course, uh, they were... Uh, their world was rocked, literally, when they were thrown into the Babylonian captivity because there was no longer a Davidic uh, son of David on, on the throne. All, all their, their hope was uh, placed on this. And Paul 
again deals with that and says, well, Jesus is that Davidic son of David. Uh, he is the promise, uh, in t again, according to the plan to the nation uh, of Israel. Paul, again, addressing both Jews and Gentile God fears. Uh, he changes his approach now, having dealt with the plan of God in terms of the history of Israel. And he goes from third person to second person. And we'll note it here as we see the person of his plan uh, is Jesus. It's going to go from they, they, they to now uh, you, 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 you. Uh, verse 26. Uh, Men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God to you, the word of this salvation has been sent. For those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not know him, nor even the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, having have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause for uh, death in him, they asked Pilate that he should be put to death. Now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. He was seen for many days uh, by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses to the people. And we declare to you glad tidings. That promise which was made to the fathers, God has fulfilled this for us, their children, and that he has raised up Jesus. As it is also written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And that he raised him from the dead no more to return to corruption, he has, thus, uh, he has uh, spoken thus, uh, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Therefore he has also says in another Psalm, uh, you will not allow your Holy One to seek corruption for David. After he'd served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep, was buried with his fathers, and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up saw no corruption. Uh, so he turns uh, again to the heart of the gospel from the they in the past to uh, you right now. Uh, and mentions again Jesus. Uh, he is the person of, of the plan. Uh, they had rejected God, but God's plan had worked out despite that. Uh, they had not been faithful to God but God would still be faithful to them. Uh, Paul sets out to explain and needs to explain why the leaders uh, rejected and crucified the Messiah. If Jesus is the Messiah, uh, he's the Davidic son we've been waiting on, uh, he is the promise we've been waiting on, then how in the world did this all happen? Now keep in mind that uh, uh, during the crucifixion of, of Jesus Christ, the, these guys were not watching it on CNN. I mean, they, uh, you know, the, the little bit of information they had uh, may uh, have been more confusing, maybe done more harm than good. Paul is trying to set the record straight, help them understand. So this, is a, this is an issue today with Jewish people, by the way. If Jesus is the Messiah, cursed is he who hangs on a tree. How can he actually be the Messiah? Uh, but Paul, again, is uh, going to lead them through to help them see it was necessary, it was prophesied, it was part of God's plan that Jesus would die on the cross uh, for them. We see that in verse 29. Now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, fulfilled all that was written, uh, verse 30, but God raised him uh, from the dead. Paul says there are eyewitnesses to this. Uh, it was necessary that it happened. Keep in mind the crowd that he's talking to. He's talking to, he's at a synagogue, uh, and, uh, and he's talking about the Messiah coming. He's the one of promise. John the Baptist was his forerunner. It's all based uh, uh, on uh, God's plan th throughout history. Uh, we are God's chosen people and all, but he brings the Messiah, and what happens to him? Uh, well, we, we basically turned him over to Pilate so he could, could be executed. Uh, you know, it's important to tell people the truth. Uh, you know, Paul doesn't really uh, know how this is going to go, probably. You know, when we're sharing our faith with people, it's important to tell them the truth. We want to be winsome. We want to uh, be able to relate to them and have them relate to, to what we're saying. Uh, but at some juncture, at some point in time, uh, after uh, we have a sense that uh, they understand that we love them, that we care about them and so forth, whether they receive the gospel or not, we love them and we care about them. Uh, and we just want to share them the good news and how they can be forgiven of their sins. But we need to tell them it was because and it required uh, Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. There's an interesting court case going on right now about the 9-11 uh, Museum uh, there uh, in New York City uh, where the, uh, the, the, the I-beams that, that, that fell and lodged and, uh, and became a cross uh, and a symbol of hope to uh, people during that very dark uh, period of our, of our history find, uh, following 9-11. Uh, it is uh, in the museum, it's part of the museum there. Uh, 
because uh, it did become, a, a, again, an icon and an image of, of hope to people, uh, certainly to Christians, but I think to a lot of other people as, as well. Uh, even in this tragedy, people thought there must be a God. Look, he's trying to give us a symbol of hope and that we would uh, look to him, as many people did during that time uh, in our country. But now uh, the atheists are back again, and they're in court uh, and bringing a lawsuit to try to have the cross, the 9-11 cross, uh, you know, removed from the actual museum. And uh, the judge actually said to them, you're going to have to explain to me why this is offensive to you. <laughs> That big hunk of metal up there, that really uh, uh, doesn't do it for you, huh? I mean, you know, it's very interesting. Uh, why are, but people are, aren't they? Uh, they? They are offended by this idea that, uh, that God himself had to leave heaven and die on a cross for their sins. Because it means they are personally culpable uh, for their lives. They are responsible to someone else. And yes, the gospel does offend. We don't want to be offensive in sharing the gospel, but it's okay. It just will happen. Uh, the gospel will be offensive at times because of the truth of what it says. And Paul's okay with that, even with this crowd. Paul's okay with that. And he lays it out very, very clearly. He doesn't say, well, it was those Roman guys, you know. If we were going to Jewish people didn't have a lot to do with it, you know, of course. We couldn't carry out capital punishment. As those Roman guys, you know, they killed Jesus. But, you know, uh, be that as it may, God rose him from the dead. And let's focus on, no, he doesn't say that. He says we're, we're part of this whole deal. It was our leaders there in Jerusalem. Uh, so Paul, again, uh, is very gracious in this presentation. Uh, but he tells the truth, uh, even when it's going to possibly offend the crowd uh, that he's speaking to. Secondly, the person uh, he mentioned here, again, Jesus predicted by the prophets. And he kind of uh, closes his address or begins to wind it down before he brings the, uh, the application, we might say, before he does the altar call. Uh, he, he begins to wind it down and he quotes three different uh, passages of scripture. In verse 33, he quotes Psalm 2-7, uh, as it is written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. I think we have a tendency to read that in context and think that, yeah, he's talking about the Messiah. He's talking about Jesus, and I've begotten you. He's talking about his, uh, uh, his, uh, his virgin birth, about Jesus being born in Jerusalem. Well, that's a great Christmas verse. No, Paul says here it's talking about the resurrection. And today I have begotten you. Uh, he's been uh, risen from the dead. Uh, Isaiah 55, 3 is his next passage that he quotes. I will give you the sure mercies of David. And then he ties that in with Psalm 1610. Uh, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. You can ask a Jewish person today if they're familiar with, uh, with the, uh, the scriptures. And Psalm 16, who is the writer talking about there? You will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. They'll all say David. It's like, well, that doesn't actually make sense since it says you won't allow him to see corruption. But I'm pretty sure David's body has been corrupted like a long time ago. Uh, again, this is uh, referred to uh, Peter when he's uh, preaching as well. Uh, it's like, think about this. Think about the context and what the verse is actually saying. Because they would have said the same thing in the first century. What is that verse about? It's about David. And Paul is just saying, uh, no, that's actually not possible. Because David, uh, his body did see corruption. It corrupted in the grave. It decayed in the grave. It has to be talking about someone else. And he says, and it's talking about Jesus. It was predicted that David's greater son, the Messiah, would die, but he would rise again from the dead. Uh, his body would not see decay. It's interesting, it's about the fourth day that the body begins to decay. And of course, Jesus rose uh, on, on the third day. So Paul here again says that we are the people of the plan. And God's plan is, uh, is moving forward. Uh, it, despite us and despite our grumbling, complaining and so forth, and our rejection of him, <laughs> Uh, through history, we see God's plan moving forward. But it uh, culminates in the person uh, of Jesus Christ. Uh, again, but uh, why did he need to die? Okay, we get it that he died and he rose again. Why was that necessary uh, in the third part of his message? At least uh, I've entitled it for Paul. Uh, the purpose of his plan uh, where he covers forgiveness and justification. That's in verse 38. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, everyone who believes is justified from all things which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what has been spoken in the prophet comes upon you. 
Behold, you despisers, marvel and perish. For I work a work in your days, a work in which uh, you will by no means believe, though one were to declare it to you. So again, this is the, uh, we'd say, the application. He mentions two blessings and then a, uh, a warning. The first blessing is the idea of the forgiveness of sins. Under the Old Covenant, he contrasted there a little bit the idea that uh, they did make sacrifices for sins. Uh, the blood of an animal would be poured out uh, for the forgiveness of sin. The Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Uh, it simply, we would say, atoned for their sin. It covered their sin. Uh, their sins were covered uh, until a time, until the Messiah would come. Uh, but it could never completely forgive them of their sins, and it could never give them a clear conscience. Uh, and the writer of Hebrew, I believe it's the Apostle Paul, mentions that specifically in Hebrews 9.9. 9 where he says it was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, again, these animal sacrifices, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard uh, to the conscience. The NIV puts it this way. Uh, this is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered uh, were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. Old Testament believers would, would follow God's law. They would make those sacrifices. Uh, they would identify by putting their hands on the animals and saying, yes, I've sinned, uh, and, uh, and I identify with this animal, uh, and this is what I think of my sin. Uh, by faith, I place my faith in uh, this, uh, this sacrifice, uh, believing that it's acceptable to God that my sins might be covered. And they went home with a very guilty conscience still for whatever the, the sin had been uh, committed. Uh, and, and a clear conscience has never come to a person until Jesus Christ died on the cross and their sins, not just atoned for, uh, but completely forgiven. And uh, I read an article a couple of years ago that, uh, that kind of ties in with this. In 1811, uh, the government began uh, collecting in stories uh, like this one, uh, which reads, uh, this one was written in uh, February 6, 1974, this idea of a clear conscience. Uh, this writer says, quote, I'm sending $10 for blankets I stole while in, while in World War II. My mind could not rest. Sorry, I'm late. Signed, XGI. And then there was a postscript that said, uh, I want to be ready to meet God. Uh, well, this is actually called, true, true, true thing, it's called the Conscience Fund. Uh, and at the time of the writing of the article, it had grown to over $7 million dollars. Uh, a lot of people trying to get their conscience right uh, before God. Uh, but again, it's, uh, it's something that, uh, that we can have as believers uh, in Jesus Christ because of his death, because of his resurrection. Or we can be forgiven of our sins. Uh, we can have uh, a clear conscience. Uh, secondly, he mentions the idea of justified or justification. It's the first time it's used in the New Testament. Verse 39, and by him everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified uh, by the law of Moses. Uh, again, we, uh, we covered this in some detail. It's one of the important doctrines that Paul uh, enumerates uh, in the letter to the church uh, there at Rome. Uh, it's one of the definitions that we use there when we'd say that justification is an act of God whereby he declares the believing sinner righteous in Jesus Christ. It has to do with uh, our standing before God. It's a judicial term. Uh, God the Father, the judge, uh, pounds the gavel down in a sense and declares us to be forgiven, to be justified in him. Uh, we're still, we're, we're, st we're, we're still us, you know, we're still sinners, but we're believing sinners that, is, that have been justified. I saw this uh, bumper sticker uh, as I was uh, leaving the parking lot the other day. Uh, it said, uh, uh, sometimes I wake up grouchy, and other times I don't wake them up at all. <laughs> uh, we still wake up grouchy sometimes. You know, we all still have sin uh, in, in our lives to deal with. But we've been declared righteous before God, justified. Uh, again, Paul uh, spends a lot of time in Romans dealing with that, but just a couple of verses from uh, uh, that are key in chapter 3 of Romans. Verse 22, for there's no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And so we, uh, at that time in our study, talked about that justification is an act. It's not a process. It's just a one-time thing. 
No one is more justified than anybody, than anybody else. Billy Graham is no more justified than you are. We're just, ju you're either, either in or you're out. You're either justified uh, by God or you're not justified. Uh, we're justified in Christ alone. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. It's in Christ and it's in faith alone. Uh, we, by placing our faith in Jesus Christ, are justified by God. It's not by anything we can do or, or could do. Uh, it's through what he's done for us uh, alone. Uh, there's a, a, a story I just kind of want to illustrate that with a friend of mine. I won't mention names or places to uh, protect the innocent. But uh, I had a friend of mine that was a number of years ago. He used to be kind of, a, we might say, an enforcer with the, uh, with the syndicate here uh, locally. So when people didn't pay their gambling debts, uh, he was one of the guys they would uh, come visit you and, uh, and make it very clear to you uh, by damaging some of your body parts that you probably should uh, pay on time next time. This is what he did for a living. Uh, it's not, I didn't know him at that time, praise the Lord. Uh, <laughs> I tried to stay away from people like that at the time. Uh, uh, but uh, anyway, that's just kind of his background, that's the uh, person he was. He was on the mainland. Uh, he was in a bar, he got in a fight, he liked to fight, got in a fight. Uh, punch some guy's lights out. Uh, he goes down, uh, hits something, uh, and, uh, and dies. Uh, he, uh, he leaves the scene quickly, uh, makes his way back uh, here, here to the islands uh, and, uh, and everything. And then uh, nothing comes of it. A couple of years later, then he gets saved, comes to faith in Christ. And he begins, you know, thinking about his past and so forth and how horrific it was and, uh, you know, all that God had saved him from. And, uh, uh, but this, this incident, uh, he really couldn't get off his uh, mind. Uh, and he uh, uh, felt really convicted by the Holy Spirit. He needed to try to go back and kind of make things right. So he got on a plane. He flew to that state. He went to that town. He went into that police station, uh, told them who he was, uh, what he had done, uh, where it was, the date that it was done. And of course, that clerk said, wait right here. <laughs> so I got a, few, got a few detectives out there and talked to him more, wrote down a statement and everything. They searched every record they could and said, wait, I'm sorry, we just, we appreciate what you're trying to do here, but we have no record of a crime. Without any record of crime, there's no way we charge you. There's really nothing we can do. You're just free to go. That's justification. Yes, sir. See, that's what God says to, to all of us. Whatever sin you've ever committed in the past, yeah, even the ones right now, in the present uh, and in the future, uh, Christ's death on the cross, his shed blood for you justifies us. Uh, and that's why we love him. Uh, that's why we think it's a pretty cool thing to get together and like sing to him and stuff because of what he's done for us. Uh, and this is all in, uh, in being with him in heaven for, uh, for all, all eternity. Uh, this is all, all our response to, to his love for us. So Paul mentions uh, in this message uh, the two great blessings, forgiveness and justification, then the stern warning, uh, and that's part of the purpose of the message as well. In verse 41, he quotes Habakkuk, uh, behold, you despise or marvel and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work uh, which uh, you will by no means believe, uh, though one were to declare it to you. Uh, in context, uh, Habakkuk is... Uh, prophesying over the nation of, uh, of Israel, and Judah in particular, uh, and, uh, and Habakkuk is kind of basically saying, yeah, how can you allow the people to go on in uh, uh, this, these evil ways uh, in everything? Uh, we might be saying that about our own nation at times ourselves uh, these days. Uh, he's always saying that God, God says, I got this. Uh, you know, there is judgment coming. All right, well, that's about time here. And then he says, yeah, I'm going to use a Gentile nation, this evil empire, and I'm going to bring them in and, uh, and uh, use them to judge uh, the nation of, uh, of Israel, the Jewish people. And, uh, you know, then Habakkuk has a few, you know, it's like it, most prophets are prophesying to people. The whole thing is his conversation with God. Of course, he doesn't think that's a real good idea and it's such an unjust thing and so forth. So that, that's the context here. Uh, and he finally says, man, if I even tell you what's going to happen, you're not going to believe it. Uh, there is a judgment coming. You may not see it, you may not believe it, uh, but there's one coming. That's, that's why Paul's quoting this to this Jewish group there in the synagogue. He's saying, you know, the, the, the gospel is here. The good news is here. Jesus is the person of history. Uh, he did die. He did rise again. He is the promised son of David. We can have forgiveness of sins and justification. But, you know, if you reject him, there's a horrible price to pay. So, again, Paul, Paul again, we appreciate, man, the way he presents things, 
uh, in terms of uh, being gracious, trying to relate to people. He's giving reasons for faith, which is important uh, that we need to do as well uh, in terms of sharing the gospel. But he doesn't really pull, pull any punches. He pretty much gives them the, the whole deal. Uh, here's the benefits, here's the blessings, but uh, there's a price to be paid for rejection. Uh, an eternity lost uh, and apart from, uh, from God for all eternity. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, we're just, you know, when we share with other people in a very loving, gracious way, uh, we're not really doing them ever any favors if we don't tell them the whole truth, you know, that there is a, a price to be paid. You know, I've told a lot of people, you know, whether you receive the gospel or not, we love you, uh, you know, and we're still, we want to be your friend and everything, but you need to know there, there, is, a, there is a price. Yeah, there's a penalty for rejecting God's love and uh, God's mercy. Uh, and Paul is faithful to do that here. Uh, the last thing, the position that people took when they heard about God's plan, uh, verse 42 to 52, uh, and we'll cover this very, very quickly. Just pause in case there was an amen there. Uh, so when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next uh, Sabbath. Now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blasphemy. They opposed the things spoken by Paul. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, but since you reject it, and judge yourselves unworthy of an everlasting life. Behold, we turn to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us. I have set you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be salvation to the ends of the earth. Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the, the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women, the chief men of the city, raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and came to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy uh, and with the Holy Spirit. So uh, four different responses here very quickly. Some wanted to hear more. That's a good thing. You know, not everybody as we uh, uh, share the gospel uh, receives the right then. Typically, a person will hear the gospel four or five or six times before they ever uh, make a response. Once, once in a while, you're going to share the gospel with someone, and the very first time they receive the Lord, uh, it's kind of the exception. So uh, uh, just, just keep in mind, as you're sharing with somebody, it may be that somebody's already shared with them. Uh, and, uh, and we just want to be faithful to deliver the message. Uh, and when they uh, kind of want to hear some more, they've got some questions and everything, uh, that's, that's a good thing. Uh, and we see that here in verse 42 and verse 43. Some were opposed, uh, verse 45. But when the Jews saw the multitudes uh, the next week, then they were filled with envy. And then, of course, they begin to uh, debate and contradict, blaspheme and so forth, the things spoken uh, by, by Paul. There's going to be opposition. Uh, and we uh, should expect that. And, of course, uh, uh, the idea of them shaking the dust uh, off of themselves and, and keep going is actually, you know, it's a very Jewish thing. But Jesus even, uh, even said that uh, to the disciples. He says, man, when you're out and he sends them out, uh, you know, if they won't receive it, just shake the dust off and, and go to the, uh, the next place and just, uh, just keep going. You know, our problem is we get some opposition and go, Man, I ain't never doing that again. You know, and it's like, uh, now actually, it's uh, the, what we call the fine print in discipleship. You know, they get that contract. All sounds pretty good. There's some fine print at the bottom. There's going to be some opposition, uh, but just shake it off. Uh, three, some persecute, uh, or many, excuse me, three, many believe. That's in verse 48. Uh, now, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified uh, the word of the Lord. You can imagine these men and women uh, that are so close to proselytizing to Judaism because they've come to know God and place their faith in him and so forth and recognized him. And, uh, and uh, now they find out that they don't have to fully enter into Judaism in order to uh, have a relationship with that God and have their sins forgiven. Man, it was... Uh, Water, water to a thirsty soul. And, uh, and these men and women came to fight faith in Christ, uh, and many, uh, many of them. Uh, and then for some persecuted Paul and, uh, and Barnabas. That's in verse 50, uh, raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas. Uh, the idea of raising up persecution uh, 
probably means that they were beaten. That was the, the typical persecution uh, in, uh, in that day. Uh, we've uh, read before uh, when we kind of began this section, but uh, uh, again for 2 Corinthians 11, 24, 25, uh, Paul there is uh, kind of uh, going through uh, some of the things he's been through uh, in terms of his own life. He says, from the Jews five times I received, received uh, 40 stripes. Uh, minus one, three times I was beaten with rods. Three times. Uh, uh, we know that he was beaten with rods in, in, uh, in Philippi when he's uh, preaching the gospel there. Uh, he's arrested, uh, as you recall. He's beaten with rods. Uh, and then he, he and uh, Silas are thrown into the, uh, the Roman prison. And, of course, then when the, uh, the governor of the area finds out Paul's a Roman citizen, he's a little concerned. <laughs> uh, because uh, he, he could find himself in prison for having done that. <laughs> Uh, so that was one occasion, uh, but uh, we really can't account for the other two times. Uh, there's uh, more than a few writers that believe that uh, this is one of those other occasions. But I want to point out with that, verse 52, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Uh, how does that work exactly? Um, well, I think of uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians 3, 8 and 9 that says, uh, Paul Randy says, we really live. Uh, because you're standing firm in the Lord. How can we thank God enough for you with all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? Paul's saying, you know what real living is? Real living is when you do something to help somebody else stand firm in the Lord. And there's really nothing else that really quite compares with that. Uh, and if I got to take a few uh, lickings along the way, Paul says, I'm, I'm okay with, with that actually. Uh, and even in the midst of that, I can still be filled with joy uh, in, and with the Holy Spirit. Uh, quite a team here, Paul and Barnabas, uh, going out and uh, presenting the gospel. Paul's first sermon that we get to, uh, we get to outline and, uh, and go through and kind of dissect and, uh, and see the, the way that he was gracious uh, in, uh, in approaching people. Uh, he didn't point out the worst. Uh, he tried to look for the good. Uh, he gave them reasons why they should place their faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, but he never altered from the essence of, of what the gospel was. Again, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that's the only way we can be forgiven. That's the only way that we can be saved. Peter in, uh, there in Acts 2 says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to men uh, by which uh, we must be saved. Uh, that makes us <laughs> intolerant <laughs> in, the, in the world that's out there. And that's okay. Uh, that's okay. Uh, you know, tolerance used to be where uh, we would agree to disagree on certain things, and we'd still converse, we could still be friends, we could still talk and so forth. Now tolerance means you either follow this line of reasoning or you're intolerant. And so uh, we'll just kind of accept that, uh, being in, intolerant, because Jesus does make very ex in, inclus exclusive truth claims uh, that he is the only way uh, that we can uh, have salvation. Paul's very, uh, very clear on that and uh, uh, important for us as we're very clear in sharing our faith uh, with others around us uh, as well. I've kind of likened the, uh, heard someone a number of year, years ago, likened the gospel of Jesus Christ to, to, to zippies. You're like, so come back next week and I'm going to, no. The, uh, if you've been around a long time, the uh, coming up on uh, a little over 40 years being in Hawaii, and Zippy's was here when I got here. I don't know how far back they go. But uh, uh, the menu's never changed. It's pretty much the, pretty much the same menu. I don't want to shake that up. You know, if you've only been to Zippy's a couple of times. Same menu for 40 years. But uh, uh, they, they keep remodeling and reinventing themselves. You know, no, none of us 40 years ago had ever thought there would be a Zippy's on Vineyard with uh, white marble columns, red brick, and stained glass windows. But, and uh, and a one time had valet, valet parking. They did when they first opened. It's like, wow, that's Zippy's? Go inside, same menu. You know, the way, the way we present the gospel changes uh, in culture uh, and, uh, uh, and the, the person that we're talking to uh, and so forth. Uh, but the essence of the gospel never, never changes. It, uh, it's got to be consistent. Uh, it's what saves people uh, from, uh, from death and hell, uh, and their eternity is riding on it. So let's, let's share the truth, but do it in love. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for...
And give us life The same love that set the captives free The same love that opened eyes to see Is calling us all by name You are calling us all by name The same love that set the captives wide The same love that was crucified Is calling us all by name Yeah. Uh -huh. 